Brother Bob's going to be passing out an uh, outline of the book of Joshua, as well as, as, well as some other um, kind of informal outline regarding uh, the successive uh, stages in God's program with Israel. And so he's going to be passing that out. Uh, something that we'll cover in this lesson as we begin to introduce the third stage in God's program with Israel, at least how I'm breaking it down. Um, what we had in the first stage... Excuse me. What we had in the first stage is the formation of God's nation, the nation of Israel. The second stage was the Exodus stage. And now what we have in the third stage of God's program with Israel is the conquest of the land. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, before we get into it, let's uh, go ahead and start here in Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9, and then we'll get into our uh, study this evening as we progress on in our Bible survey. Joshua chapter 1 and verses 1 through 9. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the, Lord, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, out of thy mouth, but thou shalt Meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to open up your word and to advance on in our uh, survey of the Bible, to understand in further detail and gain a, a, a better frame of reference regarding what you were doing in time past uh, on this earth through your nation, the nation Israel. And uh, as we start to see here in this third stage that you have with them, uh, is that they are going into now go conquest the land, the land in which you promised their father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land in which they although saw, uh, were not able to, to dwell in it into the capacity that this other, these other generations now later on are going to be able to. And as we see Joshua here, uh, as, as he starts to take over for, uh, after Moses' death, um, that that's, who he's, that's how he's going to function. He's going to function as the, the conqueror of that land. And uh, may all the things in which we've studied already and looked at regarding uh, your program with Israel, the, the land issue and the significance of it, and, and how you're bringing the, the battle of the repossession of the earth right to, right to the adversary. You're not waiting for him to come to you. You're going right to him. And therefore, all the Gentiles in this land uh, are, 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 are saturated in the, the cesspool of the, uh, the adversary's policy of evil, and, um, and therefore, uh, a great conquest is going to take place. Um, but may we also see that the, the fullness of that conquest is not going to take place with Joshua, but it's going to take place with the true Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he's going to, uh, even future from the dispensation of grace in which we live, uh, is going to come during his second coming and, and vanquish his enemies and have his day of recompense and have uh, his day of wrath against the Gentiles that will be in that land and, uh, and also the apostate element of Israel. And so may all these things start to, again, be, uh, be brought up into our mind and may recall them and so that we can have a greater, better uh, frame of reference and context for this book of Joshua as we go and study it. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and everything that he provided for us there on that cross through his death, the burial, and resurrection, and his ascension into the heavenly places. Um, we are eternally grateful uh, for that. And uh, we give him all the honor and praise. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to start off here 
um, one, of the, one of the tools, and I'm thinking about just going ahead and purchasing them for, for those that come Thursday nights, uh, is a, it's called a, a Very Simple Survey of the Bible by Brother Keith Blades. And what he does is, or maybe I'll just, uh, actually what I did a, a while ago is I kind of scanned them in my computer, so maybe I'll just print them off for you and uh, give it to you that way instead of purchasing the, the books. But uh, it'll suffice. But what he has, I don't, I don't know if we have one. Um, I should have brought it, but what it is, it's about a 40-page booklet that uh, has a timeline and, and kind of like the one that we have uh, as, as uh, where's my clicker? There we are. Um, let me just skip through a, a timeline uh, on the top, and then on the bottom it gives a description of uh, each part in which they're in, and so it'll highlight you know, a specific area, and then he'll, in the bottom, in written form, give a, a description of where you're at in the Bible. And so it's a very helpful tool, and that, I think that's what I want to uh, provide you all with. But for the time being, I'm just going to read you his summary on uh, the book of Joshua. It's about four paragraphs, five paragraphs, not too long. Uh, but just keep in mind the, the things in which he's going to highlight, because those are the things in which we're going to focus upon as we go through the book of Joshua. He says, The book of Joshua describes Israel's entrance into the land and the initial stages of its conquest. The repossession of the earth was to begin with the conquest of the land. God promised Abraham and his seed. The outline of the book is set forth in the opening nine verses of chapter 1. God charges Joshua to bring Israel into the land, conquer it, divide it for an inheritance, and keep the covenant in the land. The book records Joshua doing these very four things. Joshua knew God's plan and purpose with Israel, as well as Satan's plan of evil. As Israel entered the land, he reminded them of who they were in God's plan and what the land was all about. Yet he knew that God's kingdom would not be set up at this time. Therefore Joshua placed the memorial stones in the Jordan River, marking the very place where the true Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, will likewise cross Jordan when he comes to conquer the land and establish the kingdom. The final section of Joshua records the admonition and charge that Joshua gave Israel now that they were in the land. The special admonition was given in view of the signs of rebelliousness that Joshua saw among the people. He reminded them that the curses of the law contract were in store for them if they departed from the Lord. The five courses of punishment set forth in Leviticus 26 would begin to come upon them if they did not cleave to the Lord. Joshua exposed the inclination of their hearts by what he said. He also forced it into their consciences, consciences by charging them to choose this day which course they were going to pursue. And all this he allowed them not to he allowed them to honestly see that seeds of rebelliousness were sown among them, that they were beginning to take root and would soon grow. By making a covenant with them, he held them responsible for rooting out of out of the apostasy before it would grow. It is significant that the book of Joshua ends with these words, because the rebellion Joshua feared took hold shortly after his death. And so that's just a, a very a brief summary to describe the issues in which we're going to begin to look at in the book of Joshua. Again, you've got to remember where we're at in Israel's program. Uh, you've got to remember that... <clears throat> You've got to remember that uh, when God brought Israel out of Egypt there, and uh, he brought them through the Red Sea, and they, had, they were in the wilderness there at Mount Sinai, he proved them whether they could keep the law or not. They failed miserably. They entered into that law contract with them. And, uh, and then they, based upon the rebelliousness we, saw in the, we briefly saw in the book of Numbers, is that, uh, that that generation that came out of Egypt, uh, rebelled against God. They had a heart of unbelief and therefore they died in the wilderness. Uh, Moses also disobeys even though um, he gets to see the land. He doesn't get to enter the land. And uh, you have Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, because Moses now has to give the law of the children, that, that, gen, uh, that, that generation that rebelled against God. And it's those children that are going to, under Joshua now, get to go into the, the promised land. And again, remember the land is what we looked at long, long ago in this Bible survey back there in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, the land of Canaan. And the land of Canaan, again, we, we, we briefly saw the nativity of that land with the Amorite and the Hittite and, and how the, the, the rebelliousness and the satanic policy of evil and plan of evil, are, that's the hotbed for the adversary, that land of Canaan. 
And that's where God desires for his land to be. That's, that's where he's going to establish his kingdom right there on that land. And that's where that's through that land and through the nation of Israel is going to be in, the instrumentality of setting his kingdom, not only physically there, but over the whole entire earth and have that influence over the whole entire earth. And so that land now that we talked about long, long ago that has been an uh, uh, issue, has been a thread from Genesis up until this point, now is becoming a significant issue again because everything that they wanted to go to, the nation of Israel, or what God was, was bringing them unto and through Moses is now going to become, I, I'm not going to say fulfilled, but it's going to take place at least in a, in a portion type form with Joshua. And the, if you remember the Abrahamic covenant, in fact, let's look there, look, look at that again real quick. Look at Genesis 12. Um, the Abrahamic covenant is, is the issue of being in that land forever. Um, and we'll just, we'll just briefly look up the, the issue of the land here. Genesis chapter 12, and look at verse 1. And he, he goes on, and we won't look at it right now, but he goes on to talk about how he's going to give them that land for uh, a, an everlasting possession. Uh, but look at Genesis 12, verse 1. Again, we looked at this probably almost 20, 20 or 30 lessons ago. He says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of, I'll make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And we broke down the major co the components of that Abrahamic covenant there of, of the issue of He's going to be, become a great nation. That was the first stage of God's program with Israel, the formation of the nation of Israel. Uh, what you eventually go on to see there in the, the following chapters in uh, Genesis 13 there, um, that, uh, I think, yeah, Genesis 13, uh, the, the whole issue that they're going to be, a, 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 the Abraham's seed is going to be a stranger in a strange nation under Egypt. And then he's going to bring them out. That's the second stage of God's program with Israel. And then as they're going to go into that land, he says, unto a land that I will show you. That's, again, in a, in a, in a, in a, a portion, I don't know if that's the best way to describe it, but it's not going to come fulfilled under Joshua, but they're going to get an initial entrance into that land under Joshua. And so he says, I'm going to show you, I'm going to bring you, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And he showed it to Abraham, um, but it's going to be shown now as the formation of that nation is for, that nation's formed now, he's going to show it to the nation of Israel under Joshua. And so what we looked at long ago and, and from Genesis to now what we're looking at here in Joshua, remember they were in that sh under Egyptian bondage for 400 plus years. And we looked at the issue of the whole, the whole issue of God's name. I am that I am with Moses. Because ha they have to see that, that timelessness issue in God's name. And you can see that now by looking at Genesis to Joshua. I mean, it's simply you, you hold the... the, the the bulk of, of all of that, that information, that, that's how much information, how much time has passed. That's a lot of time. That's a big chunk of, of your Bible. And it's good for you to know and us to know as we go through this survey and go through Israel's program to, to understand that timelessness issue as well because it's not going to be when, when we first looked at that, or if the first initial reading of that with Abraham there in Genesis 12, you probably wouldn't think it's going to be 400 plus years, plus the 40 years that they're wandering in the wilderness, plus the additional other timing for travel and things like that, uh, that it was going to take them to get now in, unto that land. And for God to form his nation, to bring them out uh, and, and, and have his influence uh, have his judgments there uh, upon Egypt influence the world and now bring him unto himself and now actually enter the land, a great amount of time has transpired. But yet, through all that, God is still after his plan and purpose with Israel. And that's significant because, folks, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years more are going to pass before he fulfills his plan and purpose with the nation of Israel. 
And as we read, as I briefly read in that summary by Brother Keith Blades regarding that Joshua knew uh, that they were that they were going to be they were going to go in the land, but God wasn't going to fulfill His plan and purpose under Joshua. That was going to take place under the true Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that when we when we deal with the issue of Joshua, uh, what what God does with Joshua when he goes into the land is he's going to do like what he did with Moses. In regards to the Red Sea, he splits the Red Sea. Well, when they go through the Jordan, he's going he's gonna to split that, that Jordan River. He's going to hold back the, the, the flow of the water, and Israel's going to enter. And what Joshua does, he sets up two uh, memorials there, two sets of stones. And he sets up the stones on the bank of, of, of the Jordan, and he sets up the stones within the Jordan. And so some of those stones, you're not gonna be able to, they weren't going to be able to see. You ever wonder why when John the Baptist comes along and he's baptizing where? In the Jordan River. And the Pharisees and Sadducees come and he says, don't, don't say that you have Abraham uh, to your father. And, and, and that's, uh, paraphrasing obviously, and that's what's going to make you right in God's sight. He says, for even of these stones, God can raise up children to Abraham. And he references the stones, and the stones have significance back here in Joshua. And so we'll look at all that uh, once we get there. But um, what, one, of the, one of the memorials that Joshua sets up is in uh, connection with understanding and knowing that the true Joshua, the one, one is going to come after him, who's going to follow the same path, as it were, as Joshua, as Moses did. As Moses, Joshua, and David, those are three characters that have kind of routes of travel that the, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes during his second coming, he's going to follow those routes. That's going to be his flight path when he enters the earth's atmosphere, where he's going to go, the specific locations where he's going to start. He's not just coming to the land of Israel for, right away. He's going, to, he's going to come to where, when Moses, where Moses was, and then as Joshua's taking him into the land, and then David's in the land, and there's doing some things in the land. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do. So these things, again, with Joshua... You see, we're going to see Joshua also conquer all those nations, not all of them. We're going to see God leave, holds back some of the nations because it's going to be the true Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, that deals with some of those, those nations. And Joshua isn't going to deal with them. But we're going to see that that's all going to be fulfilled with the Lord Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, we start to see kind of a, maybe a dress rehearsal is a good way to describe it here. But we can see the parallels by looking at all this information of what's going to take place out here. That's why when you get out here, all those descriptions, the, all those details don't need to be given to you, really, about where he's going to start out when he, when he enters the earth's atmosphere and comes to this earth. He's, he, where, he's, where he's going to start there in Egypt and, and come through, just like Moses and, and come and enter the land and be on the, the east of the Jordan and enter through the Jordan, as it were, and then come through into the Valley of Jehoshaphat and then Mount of Olives and all these things. You understand how it's going to take place by what he's doing back here in the Old Testament. Again, I told you that these scriptures are alive. These things have great bearing and, and great, uh, they contain great information regarding the Lord Jesus Christ and his second coming. His first and his second coming, obviously. And so there's a lot of things that we're going to be taking a look at. I probably just rambled off a whole bunch of things, but uh, it just kind of, we're just, all we're doing is introducing um, this, this book of Joshua. Come back to Joshua chapter 1. Let me uh, give you the, the outline of Joshua here, and then we'll deal with those first nine verses and see what, what uh, we're going to be dealing with. Um, so what we have here, the fourfold breakdown of the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1 through verse... Uh, chapter 5 and verse 12 is you have the, the details of the Israel's entrance into the land. And what a, what a, again, everything that I just mentioned regarding the time factor, what a significant event of not only, we're going to see not only of entering into that land, but actually the things that are going to go on as, again, as God's going to hold back the Jordan River. I mean, just, just think about that. Think about if God promised your parents a piece of real estate, and it was, it was a grand piece of real estate, and 
the fulfillment of it, or uh, at least to the degree in which we're talking about, doesn't take place but 500 plus years later. But you're the generation, you're the people that actually get to go in to that land. What, that ought, it ought to be, and unfortunately it's not to a lot of people at, at this time with, with Joshua. Remember, he's going to send in the two, two spies to go spy out the land there in Jericho. Uh, and, and they come back and, and they're going to give the feedback of it, but then you have the response by the nation of Israel that's, that's not so good because of, of things that are going on and, and how high the walls of Jericho are and all these things. They should have saw this as a wonderful opportunity to be able to go into this land that God promised us hundreds of years later and, and, and it ought to bear witness and testimony to God's faithfulness. That man, after all these years, he really is I am that I am. He really is I am blank. And he's going to function as I am blank. I'm your conquering hero. And he's going to do it under, under Joshua. And you remember the story of, Je uh, of Jericho. Uh, we're going to eventually see in detail, you know, my, my daughter sings that something about Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. And how they get victory over that. And, and the, when the two spies go in and they deal with Rahab there, a woman in the city, and she says, all, the, all the, the nations and the inhabitants of this land melt because of the, of, of the fear of what your God did with the Egyptians and, and those afterwards. And they heard of, of God's fame and his judgment, his power and his wrath and how great he was and that he was a God above all gods. And Joshua knew that he gave therefore when he heard that, we'll see it, when he heard that, that, he, that, that God gave the nations in the land to Joshua. He, he gave them to have victory over them. And you remember what they do. They, they walk around the city. I believe it was six days. Or we'll have to look. I always forget the details. I should know it by now. But you know, they walk around in the last day. They walk around and they give a shout. And they blow their trumpets and all those things. And the walls, the walls come tumbling down. And they have victory over Jericho. I mean, what a, what a sight. What a, what, a way, what, a, what a bang to start off the conquering of the land. And, uh, and so this is a highly significant book. And so that, that's an important issue there. Israel's entrance into the land actually taking place under Joshua. Um, and then again, you've got to keep this in context of the true Joshua when it's going to come to fulfillment. And not only do they get into the land, but he sets up now what later on we're going to see in the Davidic kingdom. He sets that up and has victory over his enemies out here. That's when it's going to come to the fulfillment. And they're going to then dwell in that land forever as they have the land for an everlasting possession. Uh, and so this follows a pattern of, of what, the, what the Lord's going to do when he comes as well. So you have in Israel's entrance in the land. When you get to Joshua chapter 5, verse 13, to chapter 12, verse 24, you actually have the conquest of the land. It's a military conquest. This, we, we, we were at numbers there. Numbers in Deuteronomy, they're at that point where on their, they're on the east side of the Jordan, and they're right across from Jericho, as it were, the Jordan separating, separating them. And you have the numbering of the nation, not as, as how many people are in the nation of Israel, but a numbering of their armies. Look, at, look back at that real quick. Look at Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1. 1 of the hardest things to do, this is just, I'm digressing. One of the hardest things to do when studying the scriptures is to take everything that you read and bring it with you upon the next chapter and upon the next book. But when, you're, when you build that skill within you and, you and you have that, whatever you have to do, whether you have to write it down, uh, I, there was one point, I, I haven't completed it yet, where when I was starting to read through, I think I got to, to, to Joshua, is I gave a, a brief summary of each chapter of each book book of, the, of, of from Genesis to Joshua. So I could just briefly go through my notes and see, okay, this is what taking place, this is what took place, this is what took place in each chapter. I can bring that along as I go into the next chapter of whatever book I'm in. But when you do that, you start to see, it, it, it just starts to come real and alive and there's greater significance brought upon the chapter and book in which you're in. But look at, again, Numbers, look at chapter 1. 
Look at verse 1. He says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles, from twenty years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to what? War, War in Israel. Thou and Aaron shall number them by their what? Armies. Armies. That's what's going on. They're getting ready. They, they know what's going on. And, and, and Moses is, was leading them at that time. They're numbering all the males 20 and up for war. And he took them through those spots and, 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 taught, them through, and taught them those spots, again, that eventually Lord Jesus Christ is going to uh, fulfill about the book of the wars of the Lord there. We briefly saw that. And, and now you have the, them at this place... The plains of Moab there, since they've been there from the end of Numbers all the way through Deuteronomy. And Joshua now is going to take all those armies that were numbered back in Numbers that have been educated with the law and things like that in Deuteronomy and, and, and told about more detail of God's plan and purpose with them and their failure to keep the law contract and therefore God having to give an additional uh, contract beside the one he made in Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai that he was going to, after the blessing and the curse, fulfill his plan and purpose with them and return. And you have the, all the issue of back there in Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy again. Look at uh, chapter um, 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 26. He says, There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. That's what he's going to do when the curse has come upon Israel. That's what he's going to do at a second return. But also think about this in the immediate context as well, as far as that was Moses just gave that. The curse is going to come about. But notice now Joshua comes right afterwards, and Joshua is going to bring him into land, and they're going to, they're going to conquest this land. And so everything's prepared. Everything is right where it's supposed to be, as it were. And that's, again, where Joshua fits in. So again, they're gonna, Israel's going to enter into the land, and then they're going to conquest the land. In chapter 5, verse 13, all the way to, I believe it's the end of chapter 12. And then in chapter 13, to chapter 22, verse 34, there's a divide in the land according to the inheritance of the tribes. And so he's going to take the 12 tribes, as it were, and uh, he's going to give, he's going to give the boundaries of the, and the borders of their inheritance, the section of the of the overall land in which each tribe gets, and so they're going to begin to be established, therefore, in that land. So they got to go in there and conquer it, and then they're going to be established in the land, and they're each going to get a section of that land. And then uh, in chapter 23 to the end of the book, Joshua gives a charge of vindication of himself. And God. And uh, that becomes important because what Joshua, we've got to remember too, what we dealt with the five courses of punishment. Those five courses of punishment in Leviticus 26, and then given in graphic detail in Deuteronomy 28, those things are going to come into play. They will find themselves under and receiving that first course of punishment once they're in the land, they're established in the land. And they therefore then need to keep that law. If they begin to not keep that law at that juncture, then they warrant and deserve that first course of punishment. And what Joshua does at the end of his life, he begins to see, as, as Brother Keith described, the seeds of rebelliousness within the nation. And he warns them about what's going to take place according to the law contract. They receive, there's two times in God's program with Israel when they receive the blessing of that law contract. One at the beginning here under Joshua. And the second time is with David. And if you under, understand what's going on there, you have, you have Joshua, who's before the first course of punishment. After Joshua, they're going to not hearken to the voice of the Lord and not keep the law contract. And they're going to find themselves under the law contract. And then again, remember, God doesn't bring the second right away. But, un, but with David, he blesses them as well. 
And so he brackets in the, the he brackets in the first course of punishment by the blessing. And the only way they got the blessing was with Joshua and his faith, as it were, in God's Jehovahness and grace to conquer the land and do the things for Israel that they couldn't do for themselves. And now, but then, then when they're left on their own and the, the, the setting is prime, they're in the land, they're established in the land, they have their own a section of the land, they begin to disobey, and therefore they get the first course of punishment. After that, instead of God bringing the second course, he gives an interlude blessing with David. And it's only by God's reserve clause, Exodus 33, that we went through, of God's capacity to operate outside of that law whenever he sees fit, whenever he wants to. Based upon that and his Jehovahness is when they get the blessing and they get a kingdom established and all those things. And so all that's designing to teach Israel that the only way in which they could ever get the blessing is by God doing it for them. They can't do it on their own. And what's... And, because now, and you have the, the, the book of, you have Joshua, Judges, and then Ruth, and those are under, those are, are part of that first course of punishment, Judges and Ruth. Judges is explaining the, the detail of being under that first course of punishment, and then Ruth comes along and describes the thing in which they're going to need because they experienced the first course of punishment, because they disobeyed God, by not keeping that law contract, they're going to need something. They're going to need substitutionary redemption. And that's why Ruth is where Ruth is sitting. But again, that's all designed to teach Israel that they can't do it for themselves. And so, again, when, you get to the end, when we get to the end of the book of Joshua, it becomes significant based upon everything that took place up to this point. They entered the land, they conquested it, they're in the section of the land in which they were given as an inheritance, and Joshua, before he dies, he begins to see all the rebelliousness take place. And we're going to see, he charges them and warns them that if they continue on in this rebelliousness, and if these seeds of rebelliousness begin to take root, then what they're going to get is exactly what the law contract calls for. They're going to get Leviticus 26, starting there in verse 14. They're going to get the courses of punishment. And that's going to be their lot, as it were, based upon their, uh, their disobedience. So let's, let's start to look at this issue here. Again, uh, this is just the introduction of the book of Joshua uh, in this, this lesson here today, tonight. Uh, just a few things about Joshua. Probably already mentioned them. Uh, not much goes wrong in Joshua's day. Israel actually enjoys some of the blessings. And they, again, they get that, and we'll, we'll see that, especially as God goes in and conquers the land for them. Well, they, they partake in it, but God really does it. Um, yet by the end of Joshua and the beginning of the Judges, Israel begins to experience the first course of punishment. And by the time you get to the second Chronicles, again, which is way later on, but the fifth course of punishment begins. So if you take, you take from Joshua... End of Joshua really judges this. This much of your Bible right here is those five courses of punishment. Well, the fifth just begins, but those five courses of punishment have transpired. The rest of your Bible, <laughs> including Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, including Acts, besides Romans Philem through Philemon, the rest of your Bible is Israel all under that fifth course of punishment and the five installments that are, that are a part of it. And so, again, that's just to kind of help you to understand how the Bible's uh, uh, broken down for you. Again, by the time you get to the end of Second Chronicles, the fifth course of punishment begins there with the issue of King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, it will be during that fifth course of punishment and these are all things we went through. I'm just giving you kind of summaries to help to bring it all to bear. It will be during that fifth course of punishment that the law and its corresponding courses of punishment will have educated a remnant in Israel regarding their sinfulness and God's righteousness. And they will finally begin to respond positively by, their, by confessing their sins according to Leviticus 26. And, and again, even though you see some people like Daniel confess their sins and the sins of their fathers, 
It's going to take place on a large scale as a nation, as a, at least a good section of the nation, under John the Baptist. And that's when it's going to be ta taking place. And God, all by his foreknowledge, let him know that's what he's looking for. That's what's eventually going to take place. Like Hosea says, they're going to render the calves of their lips and to deal with us graciously and no longer by that law contract. Uh, after this, after they get those courses of punishment, as they're going to be under it. And, and along with, they're going to start confessing their sins on a, on a grander scale with John the Baptist. After this, the things we went through the last two lessons, the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 33 and 34 will take place. Again, remember those, that Palestinian covenant and that Song of Witness there are the issues of after the blessing and the curse, then I will remember my covenant. Then I will return. And so that's what's going to take place. They're going to fall under those five courses of punishment. They're going to then begin to respond positively as they're schooled by that law contract. Uh, at least a remnant will be. And then after this, that song of Moses and that Palestinian covenant will kick in right here at the end. And that's the end of God's program. And then he'll fulfill his plan and purpose with them. Now let's go through this uh, term, uh, I don't know if you're there or not, but turn to Joshua chapter 1, and let's uh, look at this outline that's provided for us in the first nine verses. Again, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, provides an outline of the, what we're going to find in the rest of the book. Uh, as you see there in verses 1 through 4, look again in verse 1, he says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I, may, that I have given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. So he explains to them again that they're going to go over this Jordan, and God's going to give them that land, and they're going to actually physically enter into that land. And that's what begins to be described for us in verses 1 through 4. And again, it's that land that he promised way 500 plus years ago to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the, the second thing, look what he goes on to say here in verse 5, in the first half of verse 6. He says, there shall not any man be able to, what? Stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And when, he, when he's saying there, at least in my understanding, in regard to the issue of, as I was with Moses, when Moses had, Moses had a few uh, successful battles, he had victory over some of the nations in which they uh, had to go through what, to get to where they're at right here. And so what he's explaining to them is in the context, he says, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. That, God began, starts to become very intimate with Joshua here. What a, what a great thing is you're going to bring the nation into that land for God to tell you there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Woo. What a wonderful thing. Especially as you're, again, you're going to bring in the nation into that land. And you know, he knows, he, he's been under Moses for quite some time. He was, he was Moses' minister. And he knows that the, where they're going again, is the hotbed of the adversary. To propagate all his abominations, all the idolatry worship that they're in, and their fornication, their adultery, and all the things that are going on in that land, and the sacrificing of their children, and all these things. It, it's, it's significant to understand those nations in that land. Because if you don't, then it's not going to make a whole lot of sense when God says, destroy them all. Men, women, and children. He doesn't do that to every nation that he's going to conquer. But there's some that he's going to do that because the, 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 the depravity and the rebelliousness and the aligning with the satanic policy of evil has entrenched itself so much that they can't be saved, as it were. They have completely gone to the adversary. And that's what a lot of Bible scoffers do. They come, I can't serve a God who destroys men, women, and children. 
Do you know who those people were? You got to look at it from the divine viewpoint, his perspective. He knows who those people, they're exactly in line with the adversary. They're doing his bidding. They're sacrificing their children unto him. Not to mention everything else that's going on. And there's nothing that God and there's nothing that Israel can do for them. And if they don't destroy them, and Israel in some aspects, what they begin to do when God says to destroy all of them, guess what they actually begin not to do? Not to destroy them. And guess what happens? That's one of the ways in which they begin to not hearken to the voice. Of, they start hearkening unto them. And they start partaking in their practices. And the, the things in which they're involved with. And their idolatry. Eventually Israel begins to sacrifice their children. Just like the Gentile nations whom they're supposed to destroy. And so you have to understand the nations in whom they're going unto conquer unto are... The, the adversaries, nations. He's fathered them. He's birthed them. Just as God took Abraham and made of him a great nation, the adversary has taken these people, these nations, and they've, he's made them great nations filled with abominations that are beyond your comprehension. I shouldn't say that because you can't comprehend it because he gives us the details. But in one sense... That, that's fitting to say. And you have to understand that because Joshua's going to go in there and he's going to wipe them out. And not only that, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, and we saw there back in Deuteronomy, and he has his glittering sword, I tell you what, it's no more meek and lowly Lord Jesus Christ is first coming. He did all those things to prove who he was and to, uh, and, and to show, uh, again, who he was and, and, and to fulfill the mandates of that first uh, that first mandate, the Davidic covenant, to, to be that redeemer and all those things. And, and, and remember, his ministry was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He wasn't necessarily going to those Gentiles yet. That's going to take place when he goes to the Gentiles is out here. And part of him going to the Gentiles is he's going to have his remnant go out there and, and, and start glorifying God by their good works. So that those Gentile nations, when God visits them, will glorify God. Will, will change their mind about who the God of gods is, Jehovah, and begin to bless Israel instead of curse them. But there's going to be some nations, especially the ones in that land at that time, who he's going to come and he's going to take that sword, and it's going to be so bloody, and his garments are going to be so bloody, that if people understood that now, they probably wouldn't want to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's because of his justice. It's because of his, his, his vengeance and his, his long-suffering that he's given man thousands and thousands of years to be able to respond positively to him. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And that's what's going to take place as he comes as Israel's conquering hero and he pours out his day of wrath, not only on the apostate element of Israel, but upon the entire world, those Gentile nations especially the confederacy of nations uh, that are going to be in that land. Well, so they're going to conquer this land from the, from the Gentiles in that land. As he just said there, verse 5 and 6, look at that again. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Verse 6, be strong and of good courage. And the reason why he's got to be strong and of good courage is because he's going to enter into contention with the adversary. He's going to go battle with the, the nations, those Gentile nations that are in cahoots with the, with the adversary. And then what we see is that they're going to inherit that land. They are, they are going to conquer that land. The rest of verse 6 goes on. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. And their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land that we looked at long ago, the land with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they're going now inherit. And you have 12 tribes now of the nation of Israel, and that's how it's going to be divided. And then uh, what God does is he stresses to Joshua to keep the law in verses <laughs> 7 and 9. The Lord gets personal with Joshua here, and exhorts and encourages him, and stresses keeping the law that he may be prosperous. Look what he goes on to say there in verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. 
turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And so he stresses that they need to keep that law. And Joshua's got to keep that law and it be ever in his mouth, to come out of his mouth. He's supposed to educate and lead Israel in that law. And he does that. He's, he's able to do that as not only as he conquer the land, but he keeps them uh, to keep, he, he, he's able to lead them to, to have that good success and that prosperousness. Because they conquer the land, they, get the inherit, they inherit that land, and things start to go well with, with jo under Joshua's leadership. Um, but again, it, what we're going to see, and one of the reasons, again, why it needs to be of good courage and be strong is not only to conquer that land, but because Israel, towards the end of Joshua's life, are going to start to rebel. And he needs to be courageous. He needs to, he needs to stick to his guns, as it were. And so what you have here in the verse nine, first nine verses is the information which we're, what you're going to see in the book of Joshua. The, again, the issue of the, uh, the entering into the land, the conquering of the land, the inheritance of the land, and again, what they need to do once they're in that land, they need to keep that law. And if they don't, then they're going to get the curses of that law contract. Well, that might be a good place to stop. Um, Let's just look at one, one passage. Come with me to Zechariah. One passage, and then we'll conclude for tonight. Come with me to Zechariah chapter 14. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 14. Look at verse 1. Now, Zechariah, Zechariah is right here on our timeline. So you follow him up, he's under the fifth course of punishment. That's, that's where his ministry, that's where his, his prophetic office is being held. So he's under the fifth course of punishment. Israel's rebelled, they experienced the first. They had the interlude of blessing with David. Then they, they continued to rebel. They got the second course. They continued to rebel. They got the third and, and so on. They're under the fifth and final course of punishment. And Zechariah now is prophesying. And it's going to be in the fifth course of punishment when God pours out his wrath. He's going to have his day. And that's what Zechariah begins to prophesy about here. Zechariah 14 verse 1. Behold the day of the Lord cometh. It's, it's coming. With, with Zechariah, it was just coming. With John the Baptist, he could say it was at hand. If the kingdom of heaven was at hand with John the Baptist, what's before it, his day of wrath, can be at hand. But with Zechariah, all he could say is that it, it, it cometh. But nevertheless, he's prophesying about the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to what? To battle. To battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth in the captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. You've got to understand, when, especially when you're dealing with uh, uh, Hebrews Revelation, the, the different scatterings that are going on, the people that are in the land, and the people that are scattered. And, and the, pro the prophets teach you about all that. But verse 3 says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the what? What is he referring to there, the day of battle? Does anyone know? We didn't cover it yet, but he's talking about Joshua. The day of battle is going to be under Joshua when he conquers the land. And what he's talking about is the second coming here. He's comparing the second coming when, when he says, Then shall the Lord go forth as he's going to return and fulfill the Jehovah covenant after the, the curse has taken place. Israel has now positively responded, the remnant has, now that he's going to return, he's going to go forth, and he's going to do what, he, what the, that Jehovah the Covenant said, and then he's going to act as the, the true Joshua that he is. 
And he says, I'll fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. That's where he's eventually going to set foot, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a, great, uh, a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Actually, when he does that and it cleaves, that's going to be a, a dwelling protective place for part of that remnant to reside in. Um, that's what it's eventually going to, to, to act, uh, it's going to function as. Verse 5, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, because that's where they're going to go. For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto uh, Azel, yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea, and summer and winter shall be like it. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. What he describes is his return the battle against those nations, the establishment of his kingdom and him ruling and reigning over the earth. Basically, what you have is all the information of the Abrahamic covenant, all the information in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and what we're now going to begin to look at take fulfillment with him when he returns. And you have added to that the Davidic covenant and things like that. But it, it's, it's just encapsulating all those things, especially the issue of the battle that's going to take place and the victory. And it's going to be based upon that victory that he's going to establish his kingdom. And as he says there, king over, verse 9, and the Lord shall be king over all the what? All the earth. Because that's God's plan and purpose of the nation of Israel. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And it's going to be in thee, it's going to be in the Lord that they're blessed. And he's going to, you got to fulfill all these things in which, which we see in a dress rehearsal type form taking place back here as we look at Joshua. And Joshua is the issue of the battle and the conquering and the war, uh, and the wars that are going to take place. Well, let, it, let that suffice it for now as, as again, it was just a, uh, wasn't a quick, but um, a quick introduction to the book of Joshua. What we'll do next week is we'll actually start to get into some of the details of Joshua, especially um, the, the issue of when he crosses over Jordan, the stones issue, and, and see the significance of that. It's, it's, uh, at least I think it's very interesting uh, to see why he does that and, um, and how it has great bearing upon what later takes place with John the Baptist and, and the, the remnant and things like that. So that's where we're going next week. Uh, let's pray to conclude. Father, we thank you for this time to introduce Joshua. And uh, again, the highlight that Joshua is as he's going to be the one in which leads the people into the land. What an what a honored, uh, honored um, uh, what a privilege to be able to take your people at that time into your land in which you're going to take and conquer from the adversary. And um, we thank you that you've provided all the information for us to, to see more of who you are and to see how you began to function as you were carrying out your plan and purpose with Israel and the, the foundational issues that we're looking at to see that they paved the way for the fulfillment of, of of your plan and purpose with Israel through your son, Abraham's seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, may all these things help us to understand more fully what's going to take place, what is yet future from us during your day of wrath and when you will come and, and be that conquering hero as one who's, who seems uh, um, drunken with war, but yet your Justice is upholding your hand to uh, vanquish your enemies and to hold them and recompense all to, uh, to them their iniquity and their alignment with your foe, your adversary, Satan. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible thing, and you call it that, the terrible day of the Lord. Uh, but nevertheless, may we see uh, that it needs to take place because you are just 
And also, in order to fulfill your plan and purpose of Israel, uh, you need to get all those things out of, out of your land and, and start to, the times of refreshing that are gonna come from your presence. And um, maybe, again, all these things just help us to build a, a, bigger, a bigger and wider and broader frame of reference for what you are doing and what you will do yet future from us. And also, that will also help us today in the dispensation of grace as we get to all, the all wisdom to see you're gathering together what, you're, what you will do in the earth and what you'll do with us in the heavenly places. And Father, I do pray if someone's listening, they have not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, how that he died for their sins, was buried and rose again. May they believe this moment, and the moment God sees their faith, trusting in your son and the complete payment for the debt and penalty of their sins, he'll justify them, meaning he'll forgive them all their sins, past, present, and future, impute his righteousness unto them, and they will therefore possess the gift of eternal life this very moment. May they believe this very moment. And Father, we thank you for this time of grace given. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity, but willfully and cheerfully according to the effectual working of your word in us, even your word in connection with Israel in time past. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.